Um, our struggles, you can see how we have fallen down in the pecking order uh, these days. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I think we can use the opportunity really more on the discussion than uh, species from one side. Uh, and people can pose questions. I think collectively, all of us here, if a question I don't understand, there will be somebody who knows it there about anything that we might talk about. As to dealing with the struggles in Africa. Though this day, let's say 30 years ago, they would have been all about colonization. Today, they are totally different uh, animals. Strange, isn't it? Uh, the struggles that are supposed to have gone away. Mozambique got its independence only in around 1974-75. Wasted another 20 years fighting each other. The same with Angola. And Zimbabwe took off to a good start and started the wheels to fall off about uh, 20 years later. South Africa started off on a very good footing and the wheels started to fall off in the last uh, uh, four years. And uh, Namibia, I think, credit to it, it looks still doing well. And uh, the, the so-called, uh, or the people, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a battlefield of all kinds of uh, foreign forces, including African foreign forces now. South Africans are becoming now the colonialists and imperialists that are getting into the diamond and gold fields of the Congo and uh, etc. and other places, Sierra Leone, the Central African Republic. I don't know whether you know that uh, 13 of our, 14 of our soldiers were killed there. They were all not on a national mission. They were in a, on a mission to protect the interest of the, of the new rulers, you know, who are cutting for themselves just like the erstwhile imperials. But Jenny, are you ready to shoot that? Yes, you have to yeah, I think what, what we were discussing with the, the protector here was that it might be an idea for us to, to have this discussion around um, these topics. Um, we always feel that in Africa that we have a specific kind of way that we always look at these personalities that prevail. And so we wanted to be able to look at personalities, and especially as we have um, Mandela, Mugabe. Uh, we then wanted to look at the challenges of the transfer of power. And I think, um, who was it yesterday was saying to me, the issue is not elections, it's transfer of power. Why do we have these challenges? And the people, I think, it's very important to, to, to look at the people of Africa. What is their character? What is it going to take for these peace-loving, very simple people to, to rise up? And uh, obviously elections, there's some key elections coming up. Uh, there's some places where there should be being elections, but they're elections, but are not. And then, I think the, uh, some of the issues that we were raising earlier is um, that leads to the corruption processes is the liberators and the chance at the gravy train. So I thought if we uh, try and look and bring in as many countries as possible. Just so, just to clarify as we get started about liberators, are you talking about um, specific people from inside liberating, or are you talking about external people coming in? No, we talk about the people, the, the, the heroes of uh, freedom, the people who fought and uh, led to freedom. Like local figureheads, associated with freedom. Like local figureheads. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether this is a, a big issue in um, the Latin countries, but I said it certainly is a big issue in, in Africa. Maybe because we are coming to democracy later in the game. 
But I mean, the other issue there also is that we remove the Mubarak and we bring in the Morsi and we're still not happy. Um, we remove the, uh, remove the Mbeki and we bring the Zuma who is there because he is part of that club of liberators. So I don't know if that will help, but we are open to suggestions as to how we can structure it. But I think it will help us to compare as many countries as possible. I have a question that might or might not be related exactly to those things or more to what I'm interested in, but I'm curious about how, thinking of personalities, how has your movement, your group, Jenny, been, what has the relationship been with the media or how have, how have you been represented in the media or I'm wondering what that looks like in terms of what has your personality been projected as in your own country? Or do you have control over that, or do you feel like that's been co-opted in some sense? That is a very good question, which I don't think we're going to deal with now, because I only have one answer. I'm a woman, and in the media in Zimbabwe, it's very patriarchal. And worse, I'm a troublemaking woman. So uh, that's really a long discussion, which uh, <laughs> shouldn't be having here. <laughs> I think, I think uh, a person like Jerry is a is, is good is a is a target for um, for uh, smart kids like the Zimbabwe and Zambian PF people. They are more look in South Africa. We can't, uh, for example, I cannot take a person on the basis of that she's a woman or any of these kinds of uh, things, uh, phobias that are there, you can't use them at all. So, but in Zimbabwe, they got a way of doing it. I could imagine uh, Mugabe would say she's a, a, a bitch that is being used by the British imperialist, uh, what is that thing of England? Or MI5 or something like that. Oh, MI5 is a new one. They haven't tried that. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, MI5 is their sort of their version of uh, uh, what you call it, uh, CIA or something of the English. But yeah, that that you see, it's the governments or the opponents. They always find a way. For example, uh, in South Africa, what they 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 do tend to do especially those people who are coming from their ranks. They are the first to be discredited. Like in white South Africa, what they used to do, every um, white woman who stood up against injustice at the beginning, and they were succeeding, they will say she's a prostitute, she worked, uh, she's this and that and that and that, okay? and. Uh, they they use that until the people continue until they drop that they come with a new tactics let's say when they because you got to use also they are smart they have to use different tactics to deal with the individual and then what they did also they would take a cat for example they won't do it to a black person take a cat and and uh, cut it and uh, you know kill it and hang it on your doorknob when you open in the morning, uh, I mean, <laughs> for what uh, normally the white culture in South Africa at that time, yo, that will drive you completely away, you know? And also they will write uh, graffitis or uh, leaking uh, communist whatever in your walls and things like that. So in Africa, all the leaders, they got those tactics everywhere. But what we were saying about South Africa now, <laughs> for us, like a guy like me now, what they are looking for, for example, because, oh, of course they go and talk rubbish to the imperialists. These are the people who wanted me to talk all the time of my life, even when I didn't want to. Even when I was sick, they would pick me up and bring me to talk, talk, talk. But now they don't want to hear a single voice that I say. Why? No. It's because I'm sure they will try to say, I have already got so much from government and this and that and that and that. Now I'm trying now, I'm kicking the, the ladder, something like that. But, uh, but anyway, to a more serious note, um, Africa is uh, complicated. And I think 
we are a generation now that is trying to say to our leaders, look, you're not going to have that benefit that was enjoyed by the Julius Nyerere's, the liberators, who were not criticized, who were not told that they were following wrong policies. Because we were so happy to be free from um, colonialism. And then by the way, it took us into a worse situation. We were not checking that. But now we're saying we must talk early. There's a lot of people talking now. But at the beginning, they, people, we, we were always also smart. Jenny was also frustrated previously when she was with me because I never condemned Mugabe openly and I would I would always have an excuse of, uh, well, because it was not a, a thing that is usual to us to confront a an African man, especially one that is like Mugabe, who appeared to have conducted himself so well on his personal life and so on and so on. So it was difficult until, at least for me, when they started, when they hit the opposition, I didn't like that because I thought that was crazy. Then from there on, so slowly, uh, uh, people are moving faster now to speak up against them. Uh, but uh, you got in the DRC where you got these Kabilas. I mean, this guy got just put on top of the people and he became. Uh, the you, you see, this the son who took him from the farm, yeah. which is the other issue with these uh, yeah. dictatorships. So we are, people are moving faster than I think, as though so we say South Africans, we are moving faster even than Nigeria in being chaotic, running a chaotic country. But we are doing it faster than Nigeria. I was in Nigeria in 2005 when I was there. I said, how can these people do that? I can't believe this. And everybody I met in Nigeria was uh, eloquent eloquent about what is wrong, what is what, but they had no power. And then I say, this will never happen to our South Africa, you know? But it's happening now. We are going to become a, a very soon a chaotic state. But we are not there, we are miles away from that, but the signs are there that we are moving towards that direction. And we think that the more we speak, the quicker we will stop that. About Yes, Jenny and John, thank you. I, I, I felt uh, I wanted to suggest that probably maybe we, we discuss about the struggles of Africa. Can you speak louder, please? Oh. Louder. Okay. Oh, you come yes. alive since you No, I'm okay. fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm a public speaker and I think I have a speaker okay. voice. <laughs> so I will just switch on the mic. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I want to thank Jenny and Jack for having accepted to, to, to share this topic. But my little worry, which I wanted to suggest, is that the forces in Africa do not play without externalities. And probably these externalities should include one of the discussion items on the board, like the six, the external factors that influence the struggle in Africa. I, I felt that maybe we should also include something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Just I, think, I think we must also try and see who are these personalities we are talking about. Do you know that my, my whenever I child my signed my children's handwriting, no, they, said, they said it was forged. <laughs> I have the worst handwriting imaginable. So you said it's uh, external. This was put it here. Yes. External factors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just saw it's trending that uh, South African ambassador rejects gifts from Israel on grounds of they are extending out of that. <laughs> well, now, now, yeah. well, uh, Israel is the only thing that the South African government is doing that is busy to take a fight. Mm -hmm. that <laughs> Maybe it's not for everyone. Say that's great. <laughs> Could you say that again, Laz, and make sure, I just want to make sure. Okay, I said um, South African ambassador rejects gift from Israel, condemns replication of apartheid. What's his name, uh, can you do? Uh, the one in, 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 the one in Middle East, I don't know. Oh, okay, I thought they mentioned his name. No. Okay. 
Okay, there's a very important interplay there with South Africa and um, Israel, obviously, but also in the Syrian crisis. Is that external factors or is it really an internal factor? Syria, you mean? Syria. Yes. The Syrian question. Hmm. It started uh, when it started. It was uh, an internal effort. It was a revolution like any other revolution in the region. But now, external factors have become much more important than what's going on from the inside. But how are the African players becoming part of that external factor? Uh, no, I'm not talking about the, Af the Syrian... But we want to focus here on Africa and the role. Oh, yeah, okay. But yes, what is the external factors that motivate some African uh, engagements or disengagements in African struggles? There's definitely a role that South Africa is playing is it lobbying Russia or is it being pushed by Russia in terms of Syria? Oh, what, do you know what their position they've taken in Syria? They won't take a position that uh, arms must be sold there for sure. They won't do that. Uh, not that the government won't do it, but it will, it will be scared to do it. The South African population will not allow them to do that. They may sell arms quietly and do all sorts of criminal activities, but they won't do it. Uh, they won't vote in favor of uh, attacking Syria or, or arming off rebels. That I can assure you, as I sit here without knowing what's happening in the last few days, yeah. but they won't do that. However, uh, elements in government might conspire with whoever, whether you call it uh, Britain or America or whatever, if uh, and then they will do that uh, to sell those arms like that. But if they are found, the good news is that they will be arrested in South Africa, believe me. They will be, yeah, they will be charged for such a thing. So is South Africa selling arms to Palestine? Is that why there's this problem with Israel? No, no. Coming back no, to, no. to lesbian. No, that, what I can tell you about uh, the position of South Africans in general, and particularly the majority of South Africans, they are opposed to the state of Israel. And uh, they will always, over the years, they have voted in favor of the, the Palestinians. Okay, they take the Palestinian, Palestinian side. And I think the South African government will never be allowed, also, especially on the issue of the Palestinian, to vote anyway. Um, <laughs> funny enough, you see, the ambassador that was, uh, our ambassador was in Israel before this one. I call him, he was sent there to be our ambassador. He became the ambassador of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And what he did, the Israelis, uh, they got him. I mean, this is a veteran uh, ANC man and so on and so on. What he did, once he got there, the Israelis, uh, uh, of course, they explained to him whatever, and then he took bought it, their story. And then he started to recruit influential people from South Africa for us to go and visit Israel. Many of us never took it because we said he was silly because now he was being the ambassador of Israel, but he got recalled. Now we got a new one. And uh, this new one, now, because of the sentiment inside South Africa, there's no way you will take even a pen if they give you. Because if the Israelis, if that comes to the attention of South Africans, it will be bad for him. That's due to the public opinion in South Africa pertaining to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, issue and the one on, uh, on, on, on Syria. Those, I can tell you, those are fixed positions that they will take. However, in others, they can just uh, hit and miss on them. But I mean, Leslie, prepare yourself because we need to understand the Nigerian dynamics. Yeah, I want to stay a little bit on personalities and then bring a new topic that has really been a question of research for me within the, the scholarly or the academic domain. There are single no African scholars try to die the inside. And that is the issue of the use of sacred, the, the influence of sacred cult on African personalities and on their their their, their, their political strategies and their political actions. Secret because court. Sacred cult. Because what is explain sacred that? Court, sacred society. Oh. 
Yes. How many points of secret like societies what? on the planet? Sorry, sorry, secret what? Cult. 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 Yes, because secret societies has an influence on the personality of African leaders in terms of how they view their people and in terms of how they appreciate the political process and the, the, the flow of democracy. Take Central Africa, for example, because made of the record, I happen to be somebody within the Central Missionary in my government where I receive, um, I receive official, based on official inside information. It is, it is a, a race within the Central African zone for every head of state to try to recruit as many members as possible as part of the new order within the public service system, within a, 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 a specific court. And each president is the grand master of the court. His responsibility is to recruit as many people as possible within the public service to maintain that elitist bond and that rule and that loyalty. And the influence of this court is such that it can guarantee their stay in power outside of the democratic process. Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, it doesn't really mean how the democracy is. Whether the people vote him or the people don't vote him, he knows that his power and his position is not dependent on the democratic process, but on his loyalty to the court. So what he gives to the people is actually largesse to show to the, to the outside world that he is committed to the social contract. So is it based on liberation it's, it's status? Based on what is it? Personalities. It's based but on how does good luck, Jonathan, the newcomer, come into that? How do these new guys coming in become yes, part this, of that? These um, new, new guys like good luck, Jonathan, actually must fall if they don't fall within the international uh, body of the court. They fall within the traditional court. So I believe that when we look into the struggle of Africa, there is a new area which we need to research further to explain or to interpret the actions of our leaders. Not only looking at it within the lens of the interplay of the democratic process and other forces, but there are also some spiritual futures that, 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 that try to interpret or, or try to, 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 to have an influence on their personality. So, so then the how does those things play out then to the people? Because you are implying yes, here yes. that <laughs> these no, are no. elite pacts yes, that Jenny. are irrelevant to people power. Yes, Jenny, it plays out on the people because in the social contract, the leader has the responsibility to provide essential services at least to the people who have given him power. Now, the people, since in the recent, are not the ones who gave him that power, he cannot give to them as in the way of the social contract because his loyalty is dependent on the, either the French government or the British government. Yes. <laughs> yes, and, and clientism. His loyalty is based on those sacred cults who will guarantee his power like they did for Halassan Ouattara. Halassan Ouattara is of, of a particular court regime. And they have guaranteed that he is going to mount the power no matter the means. Because he will not only protect the economic interest, but he will protect the core interest to maintain an elitist group. So this has a serious influence in, 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 in the way service delivery are being provided in Africa by their leaders. And it impacts on the people because it continues to entrench them in poverty. Because the leader will not say, if I don't do improve on the infrastructure, I will raise a signal and the people will not vote me. If I don't improve on the service delivery services, I will not be voted. They don't care. They just do the, the best their conscience can allow them to do, knowing that their stay in power will still be guaranteed by those externalities because of their continuous allegiance and attachment to those courts. So I, I have been always been throwing it to some close friends but not speaking openly, that it is very important for us to begin to research how secret cult and societies have an influence on African leaders' personality and their policies and the way they govern. 
Because in addressing that factor, we can also readdress the way they, 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 they interact with the people and the way they provide uh, service, services as well. Yeah. Can I uh, look at this? But also try and bring in others. I mean, yeah. uh, no, I was going to say, what do you say? And what? also, it's important to then look at Madagascar. Yeah. Uh, a coup happens there. If that is, if your theory is correct, how does it play across the, and what would be the impacts? And they allowed Ben Ali to go and didn't defend him, didn't help. Yeah. Mubarak it, fell it, without it anyone it, saying who or what. That might be. That might be an assumption that shouldn't shouldn't be brought here because uh, we have nothing to show in in, 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 in in trying to make that argument. They keep these guys out like they don't even have wh where they eventually kicked out. Where does this kind of uh, societal affiliations play for them? And what thing is that everything so for me it's, it's a it's a conspiracy. So, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an assumption for me. I mean, we are just assuming. I will want to argue you are assuming that because that's not the case for Nigeria. At least that's not the case. Give us your case. Um, Nigerian politics generally, as I've come to understand, especially now that we work on election, uh, personalities is such a big factor. Yeah. Um, there is this common joke we say around elections that why I was in the primary school, in the kindergarten, I was told we are leaders of tomorrow by uh, General Babangida, who was the then head of state. So your personality, your key personality is Babangida, is it? Um, um, it? It's a class of generals. You know, for a very long time, Nigeria was in the hands of the military. And they, they kind of own Nigeria, so to speak. Uh, for want of a better word, that is the kind of politics we see. Uh, you must build some sort of allegiance or, or loyalty around certain personalities for you to get to the corridors of power. Obasanjo is, is in the class of generals. Buhari is in the class of generals, but he's, he's of a different breed. So they try to keep him out. So he has perpetually been in the opposition class because he's he's more like the the good side. Um, he tries to mean well for the people, not the conspiracy of playing the power game to favor the people so they can return power. There have been cycles you can even check in the journals where they say for the mainstream party they want to hold power for as long as 30 years. You know they say stuff like that and. Uh, so much so that on the street you find people saying Nigeria is like a real estate owned by these guys. They share it and they protect their shares. And how do they own Nigeria? The oil blocks. They own the oil. If, if you take stock of who owns oil in Nigeria, most of them are even from the northern part of Nigeria. They are not even the south southerners where Jonathan is coming from. So a president like Jonathan is described as an opportunist who was brought in because maybe they could pay over him. But then, he wasn't brought in as a president. He came as a vice president. His president died. Constitutionally, uh, constitutionally, he rose to power. And then he enjoyed the game and played along. Did some deals with the North that they should give him another turn. And then he, he went back on that deal and is even threatening to run again. So if you go to the Nigerian politics and ahead of 2015 election, they are calling names. Nobody's talking about the people who vote. They are saying, I give you what you think. Buhari is making noise. Um, Jonathan is talking. Bamanga Tuku, these elderly state people and this class of generals are talking to decide election. So leadership around Africa, at least as it concerns a country like Nigeria, you see a mention of big names rather than what the opinion poll is saying about the people. I mean, what the people feel. That's the kind of politics you see around us. So then we need to come back to you and find out where we can leverage people power in that scene where the elite pacting is making decisions, which is exactly the same. You could be talking about Zimbabwe.
uh, or police for kids. Or, but but I think it's I think you're right. Um, so what what is the health of uh, citizen empowerment for corrective collective civil resistance in Nigeria against the backdrop of what you just explained? Um, as as we speak, there is some kind of breeze that is blowing across the land and um, it's still not about the people but uh, this group is playing into the sentiment of the people. The people generally feel the need for change and so there have been these small political parties who have been parading as opposition political parties but they are not strong enough, they don't have national um, Footprint. Uh, footprints. So, uh, as we speak, there is this major of of three or four political parties into what they are branding as a mega opposition political party called APC, African Progressive Congress. Now, this is um, bridging the southwest and the north to form a party such that, and then a bit of the eastern parts of the country, so that they can be able to challenge for power. And then they are coming up with an ideology, political ideology, that is, is, is gauged from the people's feeling. So at the moment, everything that is happening is like inciting the people that will offer you a platform to react. So that is the kind of change mechanism you can relate to closely, because the people themselves for a very long time, since 1999, that we, we became democratic again, it's not as if they have not been coming. At least, Water Tunnel explains that at least 45% of Nigerians usually come out at an election. But they are, their votes have not been counting, or counting as they so desire. So there is this offer coming from this political party, which is in opposition, which if, if uh, actually floated, the people may get a chance to change the status quo. This is all in the realm of institutionalized political action. Yes. We are here discussing extra institutional or non-institutionalized political action. So I want to draw out from you, what is the connection? What is the state in Nigeria? of the dormant capacity, the sleeping capacity of the people to take power into their own hands and take corrective action. Is it good, bad, medium, weak, strong? Maybe sound asleep. asleep. Sound asleep or? Yeah. Yeah. There was an occupied in Nigeria. Maybe let's ask that specific. Was it successful? Was it not successful? Yeah, um, is there more that can be built on about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was, I, thanks for, for, yeah. for pointing the civil society component to it. Now, all of this is happening from the institution and the political institutions. <coughs> for the people, um, it is the civil society, the NGOs, that uh, have something to offer. But again, it's, it's, it's complicated because most of these leaders are dissenting polit politicians. I don't know whether you understand that part. Um, people Most of the like, NGO leaders are dissenting politicians. Yes. Um, so that is the complication. Are we including NGO, NGOs as external factors? No. No, there are internal yeah. pressure, but there are um, extra institutional pressures that are. So falling are under there. representing, representing the people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, what, what, mm -hmm. what just, we have? Can I check, wait just a minute. I think for the purpose of uh, making this uh, discussion uh, fruitful, I think if we're going to talk about uh, the, the political parties, because honestly, as you know, a political party does not fall into our space as such, except insofar as we look at the methodologies that are used, whether they are infringing on constitutional right or human rights, etc. And uh, I think uh, the, the term that we tend to use for what we talk about, when you say extra parliamentary organizations, we are referring to 
all the people who do not aspire really to be part of the system. And I think as, a, as this group here, we see ourselves in that space. Am I correct, Mary? That's what we're here to do yeah. with. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so. It's extra parliamentary action. Yes, that's what we, we I, so I think maybe we can get back. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't want to hear the stories like they were told there. But I think what uh, the gentleman, Oscar, no, it's not Oscar, Steven. what should they call Steven. 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 Yeah. What Stephen was explaining was the, the workings currently of the parliamentary system, how the guys have corrupted it to the extent that what they are doing now, uh, in some places, they are building uh, a cabal around themselves in order to distribute patronage. Out of that, through that patronage, they managed to stay in power and they prolong their rule. Am I correct? No, you're correct. You see, yeah. on WikiLeaks, and there is a link I will give to him. Yeah, no, I see. It's the same thing. That's why. But uh, uh, that was the point you were making. I think what you are trying now to portray for us correctly, so you were showing us the prospects of, of a possible alternative to the existing uh, 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 ruling class, uh, that one of the military junders and so on, to be replaced by what you believe at least comes from with a group of people that look genuine and so on, or they might be genuine. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's it. But I think, yeah, Jenny, you can continue then. Yeah, I think, no, we, I think let's finish with him. We just want to understand can yeah. people leverage some power point. against that cabal system? Yeah, because um, as um, to. Mary pointed out, from, from the people, if, if if you go on, on social media or search, search the web, you see groups coming up from the NGO cycles, like Reclaim Niger, um, Transition Monitoring Group, so many of the kind. And what are they doing? They are, they are, they are trying to do some sort of civic education to try and conscientize the people about the benefits of participation. Now, the problem some of us feel with that and can, I mean, would rate that as weak is the fact that there is no, no concrete way to gauge and say this can impact. And then the discipline of non violence, um, violent resistance is not there, it is totally absent. Um, a few of the times you see is they are just like contracted campaigns. You see groups do, and then they address particular things, which may be about to them, not entirely the policy. Now, the biggest problem in Nigeria is corruption, which everybody tries to relate to easily. So what you will expect to see is a very big movement that is continually on the plat I mean on the basis of corruption fighting the system or uh, trying to pressure the system for a change that is lacking you see contracted campaigns like one comes about an economic policy that is proposed it goes maybe the government relaxes it uh, they are stand on it then the, the the protest fizzles out another protest comes uh, on abuse of, for instance, there is in policy, 35% affirmative policy for women, representation in government, but it is never in effect. There is no group that is constantly on the political stage pushing for that. Uh, perhaps when elections draw near like three months, you see women groups come out and demand for it. Perhaps it's too late at that point for them to get anything out of it. Election goes, they fizzle out. So there has been that lack of a, a solid and consistent movement based on something everybody in Nigeria can relate to and then push for that desired change in status quo. So that is uh, the position some of us fear for and would seek to make an impact. A consistency of a movement. 
on the particular thing that relates to everybody. Lacking. But there's still good news because there are some images yeah, of movement yeah. building. There's no cohesiveness in it. Mm. They're touching on the issues that should cause big unified movement building. Exactly. So you have some exactly. basis there upon which yeah. something can occur. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I did not quite uh, understand about the uh, secret cult. I'm not sure. Well, uh, there was a persistent rumor for, it's been for four years now, that uh, Razuel, who perpetrated the coup d'etat four years ago, and who is still there now, uh, is uh, bisexual. And they say that uh, the, the French chose him of all people, although he's completely uneducated and everything, and quite certain to, you know, to cause confusion and uh, economic decay. But the people, the rumor has it that so uh, he was chosen by the French uh, lobbies uh, because of his bisexuality. Because uh, it seems that so uh, many top diplomats in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Paris are homosexual. Now, uh, I think the question will remain undocumented for a long time, but uh, what I mean is that... I so this is a ruling elite based on sexual orientation, yeah. rather than... Yeah. But to say that, uh, you know, they have uh, yeah. a kind of secret uh, society to... Capacity of people to re to reclaim their power. I'm sorry, just yeah. sorry. You know, it's unfortunately, on you see, we just something besides uh, talking about uh, the the line of the anti bear the, the criticism of this person. I think uh, as a uh, as a people who are schooled in in uh, political consciousness. We cannot, uh, 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 for example, I'm scared that if I'll sit here, I say, no, I don't comment that, I don't make the point that we cannot, that, is, that issue is frivolous to say a person because of his sexual orientation, there is something, you know, it has an, a bearing on the whatever happened. Uh, because, I mean, we, most of the people that we talk about here, we know that they have no such a, uh, issue and therefore they got serious problem. We will rather concentrate on the individual, whether is he a good guy in the country or is he a bad guy, and so on and so on. I would like us to. Uh, yeah, I quite know. agree. In fact, that was just an introduction uh, to say that. Well, personally, I would not dwell too much on that uh, question of personalities because I think that uh, personalities is not as important as the cult of personality in African politics. I think that is a big problem. Uh, in Madagascar, there have been uh, well, popular uprisings uh, in 1972, 1991, 2002, uh, and then uh, 2009. And every time, people thought that the next uh, president would be a kind of messiah. Messiah. It was really written uh, on the walls, uh, in graffitis on the walls of Antanana Reef that Rafael Manana in uh, 2002 well, would be the messiah who would save the country. The so one who went to South Africa. Yes. <coughs> so I think it is that uh, that kind of personality that uh, you know, focusing too much on uh, individuals, that is uh, the problem. So um, when more or less related to this, I think that the elections, although we know that it is very important, should come under power and its transfer. Yeah. Because are the elections due? What is the current situation as regards those two issues? Then, uh, do you mean Madagascar? Yes. Well, what's the current situation now? 
in the last four years, uh, <coughs> uh, SADEC has been uh, trying to uh, to, uh, to make uh, Venezuela accept elections. But uh, well, the last news was that uh, he had uh, he was summoned to uh, Dar es Salaam in uh, December last year, and uh, there he was uh, shown. Uh, you know, we have proofs of how much, how many million dollars you have on such a bank account in Switzerland, on such a bank account in France, etc. So we shall freeze. We shall have your account freezed. If uh, frozen, um, if you persist in uh, running for the presidential election that we want to uh, to be organised in your country, so uh, he said. Why can he not run? Maybe for some of us who don't have the background, why can he not run? Uh, because he uh, he came there uh, by means of a coup, uh, overthrowing an elected president. And uh, well, it was to to calm things up that Sadek had asked them, uh, them both, not to run for ele the presidential election because um, you know, it was thought that Razvel uh, feared President Ravanmana to to defeat him. So that is uh, why he wanted to run for the election. And then, as he is in power now, he would rig the elections. So uh, they were asked both not to uh, run for the presidential election, and uh, Rafael Maran accepted. So he eventually accepted too. So the uh, election, presidential election, is scheduled for the 24th of July. And uh, the uh, Constitutional Court um, well, uh, had the, uh, the list of candidates, uh, or received the list of the, the files of the candidates, and uh, there were 40 candidates. And after a week in uh, April, uh, they published the list of the eligible candidates, so there were 36 of them out of 41, whereas uh, 40 candidates had deposited their files uh, at, before the deadline, and the 41st was as So now the international community is trying again to uh, make him change his mind. So uh, what I mean is that uh, the elections are really uh, not a end in itself. And I think that is a problem because uh, the international community tends to think that it is an end in itself. Whereas uh, as long as you know, people in the government are uh, running, uh, among the 40 <coughs> something, uh, there are at least uh, a dozen who are in government now. And they have been using you know, all their authority, all the government money, everything, uh, to start the uh, election campaign before it will start uh, in July. So some have been starting in, uh, in April, even before it was uh, known that they could, they would be eligible. So uh, that's so what makes me say that uh, elections should come under power and its transfer, because really elections is, what is at stake in elections is how to capture power or to keep it. Yeah, it's separated in my experience in Zimbabwe. Winning an election does not mean you get the power. <laughs> That's where the challenges come in. But um, before we, 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 we try to move on, 
Uh, you said there was a popular uprising in 7291. In uh, all, uh, in response to the coup and in response to um, Bradzelli's insistence on running, what are you, what is your capacity to have good turnout? Is there could there be more people power? If Sadak failed to resolve this, by the way, it's quite positive that Sadak had threatened sanctions. I don't know of any other circumstance where Sadak have threatened sanctions uh, no, against against uh, someone like that. Obviously, he's not part of the secret society of him to threaten sanctions. <laughs> but apparently, I don't know. Maybe France has uh, uh, given him a way out since he's uh, changed his mind once more. Mm. You know, uh, he has been. Uh, accepting uh, negotiations since uh, August 2009 in Maputo, uh, but every time he, he he signs, he says, "Okay, this is your agreement," and then the week after he says, uh, "No, I never said such a thing." People power. What's the what's the response of the people? What's the mood of the people? Uh, well, for the time being, I'm afraid uh, there has not been much uh, response from the people. There have been from uh, more or less isolated uh, political parties or uh, non-governmental groups. And uh, that's why I say that uh, I would quite agree that the role of civil society is uh, something that should be strengthened. I think it is really essential in uh, African politics uh, to prepare for what comes after uh, any elections or, or any other uh, form of power transfer. Uh, civic society should uh, help prepare people uh, to uh, particularly uh, members of parliament mm -hmm. to play their roles as a balance of the executive power. Because I think that is one uh, very uh, central issue in African governance. But Once we don't want to deal with parliament, do we? What is it? Extra parliamentary organization. Uh, NGOs, NGOs, civil society. No, but I'm now speaking about uh, civil society. Yeah. Uh, I was saying that uh, civil society should uh, prepare uh, people uh, for, you know, to think about what should come after, not just to consider, well, once uh, the Messiah uh, has been uh, put in government, uh, things will be okay. And then the Messiah becomes uh, an almighty Messiah and uh, then there is uh, no uh, counter power and uh, also civil society should educate politicians to uh, become responsible and to accept accountability because this, I think, is linked to the issue of corruption, of women's representation. I think it is high time that such uh, serious issues uh, be addressed half a century after independence. Prospects in South Africa. Um, Your service delivery is not happening. Uh, as Stephen is to be believed, the secret agreement is that <laughs> the leaders must have uh, proper delivery of civil, uh, uh, service delivery. And we are seeing a lot of action in South Africa on the streets on service delivery. Now, you know, uh, South Africa is strange. It's a very split personality country. But uh, the, the, the you know the system that we use there 
is a system called proportional representation. Does everyone know what that means? system. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, proportional representation, as opposed to constituency-based elections, as past the post, means that um, you, the MPs, get elected directly by the by the people in that particular constituency. Okay, because uh, the areas get demarcated. Okay, let's say uh, this area of with a population of uh, ten thousand people will be a uh, constituency. And then the people staying there will stand up and uh, and say, "I want to be the MP that is going member of Parliament that represent you in Parliament." That's one system. And then in that system, you are accountable directly to the people who elected you. And uh, it goes without saying that because of that, you're gonna work very hard. You're gonna be a working MP that I would knock at your door in the middle of the night and tell you that my child is sick, what can I do? And you have to have uh, uh, the answer at the tip of your hands, because if you don't, there's a person next door that I will ask and I'll make sure that next door that person is elected. So you have to be on your toes. If you promise me that there was going to be a bridge there, there was going to be a road there, there was going to be a creek there, there was going to be a school there, there was going to be a bus, I'm going to ask you, how far are you with that? You cannot answer. I kick you out. Let's vote for so and so now and take somebody else. That's a, a constituency-based election electoral system, which is similar to Great Britain. And then you got this uh, uh, proportional representation, which we think is a root cause of the corruption or the development of the mafia in places like uh, like Italy, whereby the party, the party bosses, decide who becomes the MP. Do you understand? A list gets drawn across the country of people who will go to parliament. And then it doesn't depend on your competency on anything. In most cases, it will depend on your loyalty to the party bosses. Me and Jenny are controlling the list of the people who go to parliament. Rather than you going to waste time and think about the tap of water there or running water and so on, you spend your time coming to tell me how nice I am, how Jenny and I are doing a good job in the country, wara, wara, wara. Oh, let's put the last on top of the list. And then, so that's how, that is a system that is in South Africa. That system on its own, it's a system that cannot, in my opinion, Mary, maybe you can intervene at this stage to show examples where proportional representation is a better result of not corruption. I submit that because that system is the way I, I explain it, <coughs> it is fundamentally the breeding ground of corruption and neglect of ordinary people, so they become nothing. So South Africa is governed along those ways. Why did we end in that? It was because it was argued that because at that time the ANC was very much committed in non-racialism. And then he believed that if we were going to go a proportional uh, constituency base, then what would have happened? There would be less <coughs> white people participation in the parliament of the country. So then, with a proportional representation, at least you get seats in proportion to the votes you got overall in the election, okay? Whereas, with that other one, you lose, you out. I win 400 seats, you come 380. With that 380 of voters who voted for you, your voice is gone. It's only one, okay? So that is what is my, my, my concern is. So what has become of the South African struggle? The what? what has become of the South African struggle? Because um, the, the picture we get is, um, they were, I mean, what we understand or we know for a fact is they were very effective in trying to gain um, uh, self-rule and all that. So what has become of Yeah, that's what I'm explaining now. So, 
I say you got those things now because of that system that I explained to you. Now it has led to the neglect of the electorate. And only worry about it when at the time of elections. You go back to them, you put up the top pop singers and uh, you distribute uh, uh, food parcels, you make all sorts of things and you got a president that sings very well, better than you know, Bono or anybody. And uh, he can dance actually to meet Michael Jackson. He can, yeah, he's great. And so that's what he does. That's all what he's good at, okay? But then he mesmerizes the people and get the vote again and get into power. But the good news is this. South Africa got, as you know, the most advanced constitution in the world. But if you compare it with any constitution of any country, you'll find that South African constitution is the best. Not only that, but every institution that you can think of to, to, for balance checks and balances is there in place. Then, unfortunately, that's not suited, it's not suiting the leaders now who are there. They want to operate with their own laws. But good news is that there are many people in the country who are standing up and every day there are massive of uh, protests that are taking place. But sometimes those people are protesting when it comes to the election again next year, they are still going to vote for the ruling party. And then, and then they will be forgotten again and start to ban things and kill people and ban Somalians and accuse everybody else for all the wrong that are happening in the country for now because the consciousness has not yet reached a level whereby once it jail, then they will be, they will turn against the people there, the rulers, and it will happen. That is the state of affairs here. In so the Zimbabwe is right now starting a proportional representation system as brought to us by our South African mediation team. Is proportional representation wrong or is it a political system that's wrong? Help us, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. What is the system used in America? It's not Westminster democracy. It's uh, an entirely different system based on the federal model of states and federal government. But you're still voting for Republican or Democrat? ANC or? We, when you vote for the president, you do not vote for the president. You vote for the electors who sit in the electoral college. There's no comparability. I'm sorry that Erica is not here because I was just going to ask her if she would share with you. She just passed me a study by the email. Don't get too optimistic, Kusta. I'll tell you why, according to this study from Erica. In this study, when a mass movement installs someone as bad or worse than what came before, it has a very deterring effect people are not likely to come back out to re-engage. And she says that it results in one-shot deals happening if they don't get someone who is dramatically better as a result of this huge outpouring of human planning and emotion. And it will then take years for people once more to take action. And what these two political scientists found is that it's the first two years that are critical when you need to see the emergence of strong opposition leaders, a strong capacity of the society to counter corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that the constructive program, the development of alternative institutions, can be very important. People need to see new institutions develop stronger, cleaned up institutions. So I think we should ask her to post this for everybody to see. Because in light of what you just said, not only are there no guarantees, you know, the South, Afri South African people are going to have to see something dramatically better in order for there to be a reassertion again of another movement like the anti-apartheid movement. But it's the same symbolism and loyalty that we see in South Africa as we see in Zimbabwe. We have to return Zambia because they are the liberation 
we have to return ANC because they're the liberators. And to break that cycle of loyalty, what has to happen? Now, just uh, Mary, I, I, I beg to differ on your assessment because. Well, I, maybe, <laughs> I just uh, oh, got this. No, no, what those article. guys are saying there. I agree to a certain extent that that's a possibility. But let me tell you, in South Africa, as we speak now, you can pick up anything you will see if the consciousness of the people is moving back to where it used to be, okay? Even faster than it had under that regime before. The reason for that is because the people have seen that they have been duped, and they have been, uh, uh, you know, misled. And uh, they, it's not like, even, not even like in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, it is a sheer, uh, a genius of Mugabe that he still stays in power there. But in South Africa, at the moment, I mean, how many people who voted in the first opportunity that we could have not voted, more than 1.5 million people voted against the party. You would have never seen anywhere such a thing in Africa have ever happened, where people have so, you know, such a, a quick, fast period to desert the liberators. The liberators have hung on to power for long before the people started to see the point. There, it is moving faster. And the system in place, system, have you heard of the public protector in that country? The public protector is a woman. She's a rod violer. And, and the, you see Does this? everybody know what that is? It's a fierce dog. Yes. A oh, cat dog. Oh, okay. Put bull. Put bull. Something oh, like that. Oh, what is a hot fire? Is it not in English? I thought it's a... Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 It's an English yeah. name. Eh? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. Oh, I don't oh, know, but it's just a young yeah, dog. That woman is like that. She's called the public protector. And uh, she is the politician so scared of her any little thing, everybody wants to put in the public protect. And, and it's there. They can only hope that the, the, the head time comes to an end so that they can quickly get a sweetheart public protector, which maybe they're going to get. Uh, so the key thing there is the uh, uh, construction of new institutions from what I was getting from your statement about construction. Program. Yeah, seeing, seeing beneficial impact or else what the, this article, which I have not finished reading, I, 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 I glanced at it and uh, she explained it in another room. Uh, but it's pretty stunning in its impact is there has to be something better as a result of a mass mobilization or else it cannot be assumed that the people will Rebound yeah. We are tired. Reason. We are tired. You see, you are not going to use us. You're going to have to get your new, uh, 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 what is the Bible story, you know, David? The new David to deal with the Goliath. You don't, I agree, it will be absolutely uh, nutty or madness to believe that the Custer Jack, you will reinvent them to come back and do what they did before. What we're going to do, we will just be there to, to support the cause. But you are going to have your own, those leaders have to come out of those people there, like we did come out, no, not, not known brands, people who are not known. Those are the people that will make the difference. Uh, look, we, I agree 100%, if you think that you're going to draw back the liberators, ah, we can make ba ba ba, but we are, what you say, make, uh, we can back, but we cannot bite at some point. Uh, that's, uh, I, I accept that. But what I'm saying is that you get new people. They are still naive. They are raw. They are rude. They are crude because they are not schooled. But out of them, they're going to be, they're going to be refined or you're going to get a refined guy who will come out and will take the bull by the horns. But this public protector is something new. No, the public protector is in the constitution of the country. No. The, our, our constitution uh, protects everybody, no. everything, you know? For example, I cannot discriminate you on any grounds. 
If you allow to be discriminated, it's your choice. You can move and go and report me immediately and be in big trouble. Oh, and people are scared, especially on issues of discrimination. You cannot discriminate anybody. Uh, you cannot at all. It's not allowed by the law. But what I'm saying that, and there are the, there's this thing of the constitutional uh, uh, the people come here. Yeah. Finish your sentence. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> you can. No, what I was saying. Um, but this is an improvement. This is acknowledged as the best constitution in the world. Yeah. And I will tell you something. I will tell you something. I have a friend who has talked with one of the United States Supreme Court justices who told my friend that they are watching very, very closely yes. what the South African Supreme Court is doing. Yes, yeah. They can't allude to it in their rulings, but they're watching everything going on in the high court yeah. in South Africa. So perhaps this is a vindication of that article. Something better yeah did come for, now, for now for now the the, the the constitution or the courts of our country are still impeccable respected and trusted and even that is why this uh, uh, this uh, public protector thing and others are so good but what we, you remember i said that story that what zuma is doing the sad thing is that we got this president of ours uh, you know everybody got a dose when we were born of shame eh? We all were given a dose of shame. He was never given that. <laughs> Not even a drop of it. Okay? And that is our major. For now, just for a journey, but finally say the last thing, Jenny. Yeah. For now, it's South Africa. We are not looking for any mathematician, president, economist from whatever university. We don't care where you come from. If you can just come in, and we can see that you got that dose of shame. We will be so happy. That's all what we need the man here doesn't have. That's a spell. So what he does, when he makes blunders, he makes mistakes, he does the wrong thing, he changes the law. You know, like the pigs in Animal Farm. That's what he does. I, I have just a question. question. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, just let's finish with these two and then we must. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my question is, is okay let me start with this observation beyond FSI I now understand the problem of the pass uh, the passive nature of the people on the Nigerian stage there has been that lack of understanding or the knowledge of it that it is the people who should put pressure they they grown that they don't actually put the pressure in an organized way so perhaps it's why they are slow to making the difference. But what I what is my worry is a few of these cases of like Occupy Nigeria or protests or isolated campaigns, the government don't ever even move to repress. Is is that a good thing or it's a bad thing? The government never moves to repress the people? The people. The people. Hmm? What should we say? What do you think? Is it a good How are you defining that? Um, I mean, the understanding is if you come, you come out in protest. I mean, non-violent protest. I mean here, yeah. you have the the government try to 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 make the people leave the streets, go back home, don't protest. The government doesn't stop the people. The people protest as yeah. much as they want. Yeah and then they go home when they want to go home. That's a sign of a smart government, in my opinion. Yeah. Because a government that uses repression is beginning the tale of its own undoing. So that's intelligent. But I will tell you that the Niger Delta is filled with nonviolent movements that have been at work for many, many years because the revenues produced from the Niger Delta yeah. go to Abuja they do not go to the Niger Delta. So there's a whole history in Nigeria of nonviolent civil resistance that you might want to encounter and look at. No, the Niger Delta experience, for those of us who know, is been violent. 
He's been violent. There are both violent and non-violent movements in the Niger Delta. You always the, the hear of the violence of non-violent. Um, yeah. In yeah. fact, long ago when Sarawira was killed, was the case of the non-violent approach. Yeah. But there are many. That's only one people, the Ogoni. There are many. Yeah. Many. And the, uh, Jenny's absolutely right. The violent ones get reported. The non-violent action doesn't get the same. So that is report. why I'm asking: Is it a good thing or it's a bad thing? Because if you are, if, if you come out with no non-violent uh, resistance to whatever thing, yeah. they don't really no, give will, you audience. Or I, will, I will tell you that I was an academic advisor for a workshop at Port Harcourt about five years ago. And, what, and, and there were 50 leaders of civil society. It was very much the size of FSI. And what they reported is that things are changing with regard to the oil revenue improving life in the Niger Delta. It's just very, very slow. But they've broken the impasse that existed for something like 30 years. There is now reform that's beginning to be seen in some of the states and it's accelerating. But again, this is not being reported. So you don't get the good news in Africa, in my experience. You don't get the good news, you get the bad news. My, my comment, just to tell you, is don't relax. Because we also thought we were not being repressed. And all of a sudden, you hit a target, or you find that you have built more unity, and they understand you as a threat. And then you'll be hammered hard. Be ready for it. You got a big job there. <laughs> <laughs> you have one, co one comment, but um, no, just one is question yeah. oh. about uh, the uh, the rot viper, because we've got a no but woman. Yeah, but uh, but uh, I've never heard her bark. Maybe she's a poodle, not a rot <laughs> Yeah. So I would like to know like the uh, the who day. appoints the uh, uh, people's protector. Who appoints it? Yeah. Oh no, they, she she is uh, she's appointed uh, by uh, by the way. My name is Protector That is a public protector, the same name. So is that my name is meaning that public protector? Kusel mm -hmm. That's my full name. It means that. Oh. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, translate directly translated. That's what it was chosen for. That uh, you know that we we don't uh, pull names from the head when we give uh, <laughs> names. You choose a name for it. You can see the family. Just uh, you tell me your name, and then I will know the structure of your family or whatever, or the time you were born or what was going on. So uh, now they, he, she gets appointed by uh, by the president finally. But her independence is enshrined in the Constitution. You get what I'm saying? So because you uh, you can choose, like the previous public protector was a sweet doctor, you know, a poodle, whatever, who was uh, trying to be, and she was drawn from Parliament. This one is a lawyer woman who was running her own business. She just doesn't care. She's just uh, strong. And she is so popular in the country, you can't believe it. The government is always wishing that they can get a massive scandal on her so that she can be silenced. She is very good. I just want to make one point before we close, that um, when we were leaving the last session, I was explaining to Erica that uh, in Zimbabwe we maybe have mobilized, we may have a movement ready, but to motivate people into the streets yeah. around an election is a challenge for us because they have voted so many times, the election has been stolen so many times, and when they look and analyze the character of the current opposition leader, they just think he is not worth us sacrificing. Mm -hmm. And so that is what led to Erica then finding this article, because we were then having this argument, is what is the key motivator here? Personality is not always a wise thing, because you will never get people out. But if we can find an issue to mobilize people around, perhaps they'll come out and just say, well, let's get this guy and we'll get rid of him in five years or something. So I just wanted to, I mean, that's the situation we're in in Zimbabwe, is people will not want to come out for more than one another.
know the subject has. So these are some of the challenges of coming back to the issue of personality. But the political consciousness of the people, that's what you're going to rely on. It is going to grow. It's not going to diminish. Come what may. Political consciousness is our only uh, investment into the whole thing. Like what is happening here and many other places where people are sitting like we are doing here, they are developing that, uh, that investment, if you like. We need to develop the political consciousness of the masses is our best uh, thing that will take us forward.